live right after the break. It's England against the favourite Spain for a place in the Hyundai World Championship final. Worried? I haven't slept for days. Lucas Aid Sport, The Edge. Near enough every day my mind will flash back to 1990. Bobby Robson said we could all be immortal, we will live forever in you know, English football. I was so close to winning a World Cup or getting into a World Cup final. They were probably the best times in my life and no one could take that away from us. 20 years ago, a game of football took place that restored pride in our national game. The biggest day for English football. 24 years. This seemed to be the one. You know, this was the one. It's a story of triumph <laughs> over adversity. We it's are like... going to try and win the World Cup, and you have ruined that. We did get a lot of flack, and I think it was unfair, you know. As long as you're behind us, we're behind you. A summer of football that united the nation. Games we won, then all the country part did. It was fantastic. Football with back with a smile on his face. And it all ended in drama and tears on that one night in Turin. There's only one sports event where I shed a tear, and it was there. The 4th of July 1990, the night Gaza cried and football changed forever. Didn't want it to finish, and uh, unfortunately, we did. Stop crying in the middle of the game. <laughs> The beautiful game, a national obsession. Today, English football is a billion pound industry. Players are instant celebrities. Clubs are global brands. Fans pay a premium price to watch the most compelling league in world football. Come on, United! Yes, but it wasn't always this way. In Sheffield today, there's simply disbelief, horror, and dismay as we see the terrorists. Throughout the day, the flowers arrived, and by evening, Hillsborough had become a memorial ground to those who died. 20 years ago, English football was in steep decline, tainted by violence and tragedy. 96 Liverpool fans were killed in Hillsborough's overcrowded pens, built to contain the hooligan culture that was blighting English football. You went to a football match in, in that period knowing there could be trouble, knowing that people might get hurt. The English public were rapidly falling out of love with their national game. I remember going to a match in the 80s, and I thought football's finished, you know. They, they were fouling each other for fun on the pitch, it seemed to me, and then there was a great deal of hooliganism around the match as well, and I thought, it's not right, there's something desperately wrong with this game. English club sides had already been banned from all European competition five years earlier, but trouble continued to follow the national team on its travels. Any time you get trouble with English fans overseas, we feel it's a blot on the fair name of our country. With the World Cup in Italy approaching, the mood was one of fear and trepidation. Bobby Robson and his England team were under intense pressure from the media, having endured a disastrous European Championships two years earlier. I don't read the papers. I've got no oh, no, gentlemen, come in, just keep it. Die. In 1988, the European Championship had been bad for England. I mean, Bobby Robson was slated by the press, and I mean, they wanted him to resign, sack Robson all over the papers. A lot of it was unfair at the time, and it was horrible, and he was very, very hurt by it. Come on, I distinctly remember the press 
uh, conferences that Dad had to go through and that I would watch from afar. The news conference then degenerated into a shambles as Robson threatened to walk out, angered by the persistence of photographers. His face during the press conferences when the, when the, when the press were gunning for him, um, because I can distinctly remember the press, you know, wanted him out of the job and, and they didn't get away. It stirred things up even more, really, and got, uh, got even, even nastier. Some of the things that he went through, certainly that I was involved with, I think probably were unacceptable. Quite personal attacks. There was a vicious circulation war where, where we, we were in an era where anything went. One of Robson's fiercest critics was Mirror football writer Nigel Clark. I don't feel any remorse about what I wrote about Bobby because I couldn't understand why he made the decisions he made and chose to play the way he did. And so, yes, I, I got into his ribs. That's my job. Press comments began. He'd say, uh, thanks for turning me over again, Nigel. I was like, OK, Bob, any time. Just two weeks before the start of the tournament, the Sun leaked the news that Robson would be leaving the England manager's job after the World Cup, having signed a contract to manage PSV in the Dutch league. The FA. Um, said to him that they weren't they weren't going to um, renew his, his post his, his contract uh, and he knew he had to you know seek uh, employment elsewhere which he did but he got massive criticism for that it was like he was unpatriotic and he you know he, he put himself first before the country if you knew Bobby Robson that was never ever the case we are going abroad to try and win the World Cup for our country with a decent bunch of players and you have ruined that some of you have ruined that all it did was unite the camp even more. Um, if it could have been United anymore, because each and every player that was involved or played under Sir Bobby Robson has a, had, a, had a great love for him. And, uh, you know, and I was no exception. What we wanted to do was we wanted to win it for him. The stage was set for football's showpiece event in one of the world's most passionate footballing nations. Italia 90 was to take place in some of Europe's finest stadia and all played out to the soundtrack of Puccini and Pavarotti. But while the footballing elite took their place on mainland Italy, England and their supporters, the outcasts of world football, were quarantined on the island of Sardinia. England's opening match pitted them against Jack Charlton's Ireland. After the first match, there were calls for the team to go home in the red tops. You know, disgrace, send them home. What a waste of time. And England could have a real problem now. Really, it's been shambles second half. If they play like that against uh, Holland, they might as well not turn up. Everybody's depressed and everybody is, again, I suppose, very critical. You said people back home have had a hammering again. Uh, but the players um, certainly didn't like the criticism of Robson at the start of the World Cup. Um, and I can remember, for instance, um, no press conferences for about a week because the players refused to talk to the media. So it's secret. It's not secret. Hello, especially for you. I was there as a sports correspondent for ITN. My job was to just cover the England team, and we got you know, reasonably close to Bobby Robson, but the team were very suspicious of the media. There was a real tension, I have to say. Everybody seems to just be slaughtering and picking out the bad points all the time, non-stop, and it's a joke. Keep faith in us, because um, as long as you're behind us, we're behind you, and we will give 100% every time. And don't believe everything you read. The press were discussing really towards that tournament. We did get a bit flat, and I think it was unfair, you know. Bobby uh, cancelled the, the newspapers, getting arrived into the hotel, so we never got to see any of it. Keeping that side of it out of it uh, made us better, and we did not know what was going on, you know. And what that did, that gave us a siege mentality. And the more the World Cup went on and, and progressed, the more determined we were to stick together. 
Coming up, a bold New England team emerges as Robson proves the doubters wrong. As sweet as a nutter catch. And England's precocious young star comes of age. World Cup 1990 was the best time of my life. I just absolutely loved it, you know. Italia 90 was in full flow. Roger Miller! Oh! This is Bay, all right. A World Cup with the power to create new footballing heroes. Mateos can go again. Oh, great goal! But after their lackluster start, England looks set to remain amongst the also rounds of world football. England's poor showing against the Irish had led to a vicious backlash in the media. But the press had underestimated Robson and his team. A tactical switch to a continental sweeper system was employed in England's next game against the Dutch. A rejuvenated England outplayed the European champions on a night when their young playmaker finally announced himself on the world stage. Having forced his way into the England squad late in the day, Paul Gascoigne was England's secret weapon. I can remember the moment where things turned around completely. Gaza did a Cruyff turn and completely flat-footed a couple of Dutch players. Now, as part of the inferiority that we had, we thought everything Dutch was brilliant. They were the inventors of total football, Johan Cruyff, they knew exactly what they were doing. And here was one of our own doing to them what they'd been doing to us for years. Oh, that's going to stop brilliantly here. Things I used to do when I was younger. All I did is just used all them skills I, I learned when I was younger and done it in the World Cup, you know? The young Cruyff turn and beating other players four or five at a time. <laughs> well, here's Gascoigne now. Oh, yes, beautifully round the first challenge and still there. Oh, it was a foul, surely. It's so probably the overseas because we need two balls, one for you and one for the team. That's a, that's a brave run from Gascoigne, gone for the heart of the defence. Gascoigne has sublime skills ability to take people on to go past people to to see a pass he was very very creative he was something that hadn't been produced in England for a very very long time and I remember he used to call me dad after games as soon as the game finished I wasn't really listening to him. so Bobby after the game I'd just get on the phone and the show and ring me dad how's it going did I play all right you know but I knew I did well a newer more expansive England team was emerging with rising stars like Platt and Wright Barnes and Waddle were the flair players. Lineker, the ace goal scorer with the clean cut image. Shilton, the veteran goalkeeper in his last campaign. Hardman, Butcher, and Pierce epitomized the team's never say die attitude. But it was Gascoigne who was the center of attention on and off the pitch. Life with Gaza was never dull. Oh, <laughs> In many ways, he's one of the last to have had a direct link to the fans. You know, he, he was the guy who you could imagine uh, having a beer with after the game. I'm the same guy as the guy that's on the duel back in where I live in Dunson. I mean, because I kick a stupid football about on a Saturday, that I've got to be different from him. The World Cup 1990 was the best time of my life. I mean, it was great. I, I just absolutely loved it, you know. He was a pest, really, in the hotels. I mean, he, was, he didn't sleep. He was on the tennis court. He was playing table tennis. He was swimming. He was doing all kinds of things. So he was just unbelievable. It was like having a 10-year-old boy around you. He was mad. Chrissy Waddle was his roommate. Chrissy Waddle was always in our room just to escape him. It's unbelievable because Waddle was Chrissy Waddle just wanted to get away because he didn't stop. We had race nights. Gary Lineker and myself were, were bookmakers. And the back marker is Jake Lambert. When Gaz is around, he's always gonna cause some sort of problem or other or uh, keep players on their toes. It was a time when a drinking culture was still an accepted part of life in the England squad. 
who was part of the escape committee that we that we formed in in Sardinia. Um, we used to go down to this little bar. If it came down to a drinking World Cup, we, we would have won it hands down. And you think of the drinking that we did and, and the socialising and the laughs that we had. It was like a lad's sort of like, you know, six week bender or stag, stag sort of do. We want to get loaded and we want to have a good time. The thing about it was, was that the players, when it came down to training, when it came down to what it really mattered was the football, the lads were like, bang, it's like a switch. They just turned it on and they could do it. Last week's number one is this week's number two. It's Adamski with Killer. We promised you a special surprise and here it is. Our new number one is the best football song ever, England New Order. And live by satellite in Sardinia, we should have John Barnes and Paul Gascoigne. Gentlemen, welcome to Top of the Pops and congratulations. <laughs> Gazza, tell me about the training and how pre preparations are going for the big match coming up on Monday. How are things going? Well, that has absolutely nothing to do with the record. <laughs> a World Cup song for the Acid House generation. A group of players the fans could identify with. After years in the doldrums, football was becoming fashionable again. Express yourself. motion was fantastic, particularly because the players had a huge involvement in it as well. It went to number one whilst we were out there in, uh, in Sardinia. It was a feel-good factor as well. It helped to have a good song behind us. Back in Italy, England were growing stronger with each game. the group. Round two, Belgium and Bologna. Only England could find a way of preventing this drama of the penalties now. Well, maybe Gas Deep into extra time, Robson's men were only seconds away from the dreaded penalty shootout. If England could just unlock the door with this free kick, we'd be saved all that drama. What followed will live long in the memory of any England fan. It was a moment that would change the life of one England player forever the last minute we get a free kick in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the park and, and I do what what I would do I go and get into the box chip in there and play scored! And let me tell you you know nine times out of ten I'm not connecting with that ball certainly not as sweet as I did there it's just perfect timing it's just sweet as a nut I catch it I mean it's past the keeper before he can even think about it that goal in particular is is what made my World Cup. David Platt has clinched it for England in the last seconds of extra time. I am constantly thanked for the feeling that it gave people my goal against Belgium. Supporters, my generation now, my age now, know where they was when I scored that goal. And then all of a sudden things got to England are in the quarterfinals. And on the bench, they're all smiles. Look at Bobby Robson's smile. It was just an incredible feeling and an incredible buzz. And uh, they had this dance, let's all have a disco, and they'd jump up and down and punch the and all that stuff. Let's all have a disco and all that. Yeah, did that. Yeah, it was funny, yeah. Those moments you don't want to let go, those moments you don't want to ever end. Crap now, though, but it was funny at the time when I was, when I was a lot fitter and a lot slimmer. <laughs> Partly on, and uh, you know, the more games we won, the more we partied as a team. Certainly did. The more the fans partied, the more the country partied as well. It was fantastic. All of a sudden, I think a country, the media as well, looked at it and thought, "Hang on a minute, here we're playing Cameroon in the quarterfinals. This is practically we're through to the semi-finals. We play Cameroon, we get through to the semi-finals. God, anything can happen." England started well. But they had underestimated the Cameroons. Miller, that's going to be a penalty. It's 1 1. Who hit back with two goals. Cameroon are in the lead. And suddenly a crisis.
crisis has developed for England. Touch it again, and that's surely a penalty. As so often before, England were rescued by the cool nerve of their star striker. Here he goes. It is 2-2. Two -two. Lineker won and converted two vital penalties. Now they're only two games away from winning the thing, so everybody's upbeat now. Everybody's thinking, wow, listen, what a good guy Bobby Robson is, by the way. Even England's fiercest critics were jumping on the bandwagon. Three weeks earlier, they called to send them home. Now, they were writing a different story. Suddenly, we're all on the phone, because in those days, there's no laptops. We're all on the phone, ad-libbing, England last night sensationally came through, blah, blah, blah. England heroes, Platy on the back, Robson, and suddenly, Everything had changed. We can play. We can beat them. We can win the World Cup. And of course, what happened was one of the most dramatic matches in England's World Cup history. Still to come, England prepares for its biggest match in a quarter of a century. To point to the three lines and just say, that is what it's all about. Everybody was up. We'll win this now. Sports, the edge. Hello, a very good morning to you. It's six o'clock on Wednesday, the 4th of July, American Independence Day, and also the biggest day for English football for 24 years. It's the final whistle! England are in the semi finals of the 19th. They had entered the tournament under a barrage of criticism and abuse, but now England found themselves just one game away from a World Cup final. Nelson Mandela was visiting 10 Downing Street, and the Rolling Stones were set to play a sellout concert at Wembley Stadium. But there was only one thing on most people's minds football. Final preparations are underway for Our England's most important Our football match. Expect one of the biggest electricity demands ever. Here we are in the semi-final. It's a World Cup semi-final. Football's our national game. We're going to go into the World Cup final. It's 1990. We haven't been there since 1966. Goodness me. What? You know, you put it on the television. I'm sorry. The whole country's going to stop and going to watch it. The rush hour came early as many struggled to get home to watch the big game. An hour before kickoff, Newcastle city centre was deserted, except for those rushing to get seated in front of the television before the match started. Whether you were a football fan or not, it was simply unmissable. I remember saying that half the population of the country are going to watch this. And I said, what the other half are doing, I can't imagine because I couldn't imagine it, because it seemed to me as a football fan, and this was a, such a fantastic occasion, why wasn't everybody watching it? Sales at off licenses were up as people stopped to pick up a little liquid refreshment. We didn't know what was happening back home. We didn't know that it was building up unbelievably well, and, and the interest and the noise and all these kinds of things. It was incredible. We didn't know that. Live from Turin, England against West Germany for a place on the world's finest stage and the possibility of eternal glory in the eternal city of Rome. Those fortunate enough to be in the Stadio della Alpe that evening waited expectantly for the drama about to unfold. I can remember thinking to myself, this is a great privilege to be covering this. I can remember getting, you know, phone calls from, from, from home and people saying, can you believe how lucky you are? You know, it beats working. It was absolutely fantastic being in the World Cup as a, as a seven-year-old with my dad. Absolutely wonderful experience, wouldn't change for anything. I remember there being thousands and thousands of England fans in the beginning of the game, um, being a really, really great atmosphere and really, really loud. I mean, I'd done Olympics and previous World Cups and all sorts of things in my, in my broadcasting life, luckily, but this seemed to be the, the one, you know, this was the one. just minutes to go until kickoff. 
England's players were preparing for the biggest game of their lives. The atmosphere amongst the players in the dressing room you know, was, was intense, to say the least. When you got Terry Butcher in your side, who, is, who was a very, very strong-minded lad, he'd be punching the walls and saying, this is for England, you've got to get out there and you've got to do it. So all of a sudden, you know, you're wanting to, you're wanting to fight the world. Terry Butcher was brilliant. He was shouting, this is my house, this is my home. No one, no one beats me in my own house, you know. How can you think about motivating a team to play in a World Cup semi-final? There's no motivation needed. You just, you just point to the badge. Just point to the three lines and just say, that is what it's all about. Bobby Robson came up, he just stood up, he said, can I have a little bit of quiet? And he went, before this game starts, I want to tell you how proud I am of each and every one of you for getting this far. And you know what? Even to now, that brings tingles, because, that, you know, to me, because he was, he was genuine, he was proud of us all. And he said, and I, and I look at you all as sons, I mean. He said, we could all be immortal. I think that was his phrase, which, you know, stirs the blood and gets you going, you know, we could all be immortal, we will live forever in, you know, English football. Standing in their way were the formidable West Germans. They'd cruised through the earlier rounds and were the hot favourites to lift the World Cup. The stage was set for another titanic clash between two of football's great rivals. After 89, the finish of the Berlin Wall and the finishing of, of the east part of Germany, the people come together so close to celebrate together the first time a football competition. We had a huge concentration and the whole team were convinced to, to win the, the World Cup in Italy. England started strongly. And indeed, a shot from Gascoigne. Surprisingly, the game was more open than I thought it would be. You know, I thought that um, it would be a lot tighter. I mean, it was really end-to-end -end football, and I think that's why it's remembered as such a, a terrific game. Trying something from long range. Shot and a good save. England had dominated for long periods of the first half. Crossed in once more, and Lineker almost getting on the end of it. But it failed to make the breakthrough. If you find yourself sitting on the edge of your seats at home, don't worry, I'm sure that there are millions in our country doing the same. Fifteen minutes into the second half, the West Germans were awarded a free kick. I couldn't see them scoring unless it was something really lucky or something really spectacular. I got my wall lined up. Uh, everything was great, because we were well prepared for set plays. And now comes the big, dangerous moment for England. I was told to get out there and block. I'd done what I could, but the ball hit me. The next thing you see it go up in the air, you think, well, that's OK, because Peter's there. That horrible moment, you think, he ain't going to get there. And he hasn't got there. And it's in the back of your net. Curled off. shows his disgust. I've seen it a million times. Should Peter Shilton have saved it? Was he a bit slow getting there? There's only one person in this world that knows whether he could have saved it, and that Shilton himself. You're going to get people making comments, but really, they don't know what they're talking about. As a goalkeeper, you've, you've really sort of got no chance in that situation. It was just a fluke goal. For the millions watching back home, it was a devastating blow. Oh, our luck has now finally run out. This is woeful. You know, this is Germany, after all, the uber successful team. We're not going to get back in here. I can't remember thinking, oh, it's, it's just not going to be our idea. They've got the luck on their side. Just had to get a head stone, get back in the match. As the clock ticked down, Robson's men poured forward in search of an equaliser. Gascoigne knocks it in there and just wide from Mark Wright and Pierce both up there. England were ten minutes away from being knocked out of the World Cup. Somehow I found myself over the halfway line. I just put a ball into what I, I assumed was a decent area. 
Gary does what he does best. And Lineker will bounce come to Lineker. It might come to Lineker. I just remember the noise of the crowd. And the crowd going absolutely mad and everybody jumping up and hugging, which made me realise what, what had actually happened. Even the Italian police, I think, were, were enjoying the fact that England had scored. I've only ever seen an English press box get off their feet twice in my career. Um, once was when Lineker equalised with 10 minutes to go against Germany at 1990, and the other one was Michael Owen's goal um, against Argentina in 1998. And they're the only times I've seen the cynical bunch that we are get off our feet and actually punch the air and say, you know, yes, come on. The joy in the stadium was shared by millions in pubs and living rooms across the land. Ninety minutes were up. Extra time would be required. Fifteen minutes each way to come in extra time. West Germany one, England one here in Turin. We take a short break and then you'll be back for the action. We thought, ah, oh, this is its turn for us. The German heads will go down because they thought they'd won it. Everybody was up. We'll win this now. What happened next remains etched on the minds of all those who witnessed it. Coming up. I've seen the referee with a yellow card over I was devastated. He's not far from tears there. God, I'm going to miss the final. I'll forget if we win, you know. It'll be England's first ever penalty shootout. A place in the World Cup final at stake. England could be in trouble. Lucas Age Sports, the edge. Turin, 4th of July, 1990. England versus West Germany for a place in the World Cup final. Gary Lineker's late equaliser had rescued England and taken the game into extra time. Bobby Robson and his team were within touching distance of their dream. But it was a dream that was about to turn into a nightmare for their star player. Into Gascoigne's path, trying to shoulder a defender out of the way. I think there was a, a huge collective groan when Gazza lunges in for the tackle. We were all saying, don't go for it, don't go for it. Oh, he's gone for it, he's gone for it. The yellow card for Paul Gascoigne which means that if England go into the World Cup final, sadly for Gascoigne, he will not be a part of it. I seen the referee with a yellow card over there. I was devastated. I mean, the first thing I just went through mind is like, God, I'm going to miss the final. I'll forget if I win, you know. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Look at that look on his face. He knows he's not far from tears there. And there was an amazing turn to Bobby Robson by Lineker, you know. Watch him. And a picture that will live long with us. And I still, to this day, when I look at it, I still don't think I touched him, you know? I mean, seeing the guy was six foot four rolling about like a little kid, you know, it drove his nuts when I still say it, you know? Me? No, I'm not the type to make that kind of stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was a foul, but you, you don't care if a referee gives a booking with the other players, you know? And the crowd here in Turin chanting, we love you, Gaza, trying to lift him again. With the game on a knife edge, both teams went in search of the goal that would take them to the final. We had chances, they had chances. I particularly remember the, the chance that Chris Wardle had. Now Wardle, the left foot, the Now, if that's an in inside, that's a goal. Whoa, how, how close were we to actually getting into a World Cup final? And, and I think that is the, that's, that's the difference. West Germany also came agonizingly close. But two hours of football had failed to separate the two teams. It'll be England's first ever penalty shootout. And what a time for it to come. A place in the World Cup final at stake. I was there to take one of the penalties. Obviously, I think with the state of mind I was in, it was best that I didn't take the penalty, you know. For those watching, the tension was almost unbearable.
If you can imagine walking from the halfway line to the penalty spot in a penalty shootout, knowing that if you miss, the nation is out. Millions and millions of people watching back home. It's down to you to score. Gary Lineker with penalty number one. One nil to England. I remember the main thing about the penalties was being excited that they're at our end. That was the first great thing. As the penalties were going through, I basically couldn't look. Now, can Peter Shilton save this one? I knew what I was going to do anyway, that I was, I was basically going to wait as long as I could and try and read the penalty so that if it's hit straight at me, I've still got a chance. I'd played with Peter Shilton for many years, with Southampton and then to Derby and with England, and I'd never seen him save a penalty. Frame at me, Shilton. It's there, that's 1-1. One, one. There was something about the penalty shootout that made it perfect television, even for people who didn't really follow football. Nation urging Peter Beardsley. Just stick it in the back of the net, which he's done. The drama was etched out there. You either scored or you didn't. Mateus with the shot. 2-2. Two -two. David Platt, penalty taker for Aston Villa. Your mind is trying to think about billions watching it all, about the magnitude of he miss, about this, that, the other. I knew what I was going to do with the penalty going into it. It changed my mind. David Platt. I mean, even walking back, I knew that I would never change my mind ever again on a penalty, because I should have put it the other side. England and their fans prayed for a West German miss. Well, literally had no chance with any penalty, I don't think, to be fair. The Germans are the best in the world at it. Maybe we were more focused and more convinced to pass to the final than the English squad. Stuart Pearce. I think, I think we were all confident that Stuart would, uh, would do it. He was so single-minded. First time that I was sort of heart sunk a little bit and realised that it may not be in our day. And now a big job for Peter Shilton to do. When the first one's missed, you're like, oh no, come on, Peter, come on, Peter. With the Germans with a chance to go 4 3 ahead. If Germany score, you're like, oh my goodness, this one's got to go in. Chris Waddle comes forward. And the only way England can survive is for Waddle to score. I was looking down at the ground, hoping that it would just go in. As he was stepping up, the, the, the crowd just went quiet, deathly quiet. Now, oh, Chris Waddle. It. You know, and, and he, he said, I think, am I dreaming this? Did I actually see that? Did, did we miss that? Are we out? You know, uh, wow, wow. Yes! West Germany going to the final, and England sad, sad, sadly are out. After all the, the hard work, it, you know, you were, you were gone, really. I was so close to winning a World Cup or getting into a World Cup final. We were absolutely devastated. It's heartbreaking. It is, it's heartbreaking. I'll never get to play in a World Cup again. And so when I get to see bits of that, uh, it is hard for me to watch it. The two lads were destroyed one day. You can understand that too, you know. Carrying the hopes of the nation. That was Bobby. A hero anyway, but um, what might have been. The English public and their national team were united in grief. One single image was to define the moment. It was maybe five, maybe even ten minutes after the game, uh, and um, um, 
Paul Gascoigne was wandering around the pitch. I mean, I was packing up like everybody else, um, but I picked up my camera and just took a look at oh, how that looks nice, click, 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 click. And what amazes me is that nobody else actually seemed to, to take it because, uh, um, I mean, there was loads of photographers around me, but um, they didn't. I mean, I could tell immediately I took it that it was very important. Gaza was an emotional person. He was patriotic and he was uh, childlike, and the photograph encapsulated that. I was crying because I knew it was the end of a tournament for me. Like I said, being in the boys' club, you know, and being with a great bunch of players, um, which you never get that, you know, and that, no one, I'll never get that again. Didn't want it to finish, and uh, unfortunately it did. The nation kind of put their arms around him and, uh, and liked him for it, loved him for it. A new um, era of following English football happened at that moment. You know, it wasn't just the guys in the pub, it was the wives, the girlfriends, and the children as well, because they loved Gascoigne for what he stood for. Bobby Robson's team surpassed all expectations this evening, but in the end, their World Cup campaign was shattered by a footballing lottery. Mark Austin, ITN Sports, you're in. I've shed a tear a few times when covering major disasters and seeing, witnessing terrible things and war zones and things. But there's only one sports event where I've shed a tear, and it was then, and I don't mind admitting it. You know, it, it was just very, very sad. There's not much we can do, you know, it's over for us, and uh, we've played a major part in the tournament. We've done very well to get to the semis, and, uh, we can go home, you know, feeling very proud of it, I think. But as the England players and supporters left the Stadio della Alpi, one young England fan had got his hands on his own piece of history. The ball bounced and landed round row 12, just in front of us. Um, my dad immediately, I suppose, instinctively picked up, scooped the ball up. Um, handed it to me, put the ball in the bag, and I think we were probably one of the first people out of the stadium with the match ball. It's got unbelievable sentimental value, the ball. Um, unfortunately, my father passed away about 10 years ago now, so really for me, it's a, it's a really, really great memory um, that I have of him and, and a great time that me and him had together in Italia 90. Eighth of July, Luton Airport. Six weeks earlier, Bobby Robson and his team had left as supposed no hopers. Now, they returned as heroes. I was, you know, I was still drunk on the plane when we got when we landed at Luton, and we had gone to the bus, um, separated from our families. A quarter of a million people at Luton it was the most bizarre and wonderful experience ever. We weren't prepared for it. We were told that um, we would have to get a police escort back to the hotel because a lot of people had come. I mean, we only went two miles. It took us three and a half hours, something like that, to get there. We were being past Big Macs and burgers and chips and that out under the bus, which we had a lovely course. He had the false pair of breasts on as well, and I had the stewardess's hat on. I've seen so many fans in all my life. Football was back with a smile on his face. It was great times. People climbing up and on roofs. Any available space was taken. It was just a terrific fear. I've got to say that, you know, it did cross my mind that, you know, you think, well, crikey, you know, this is to get to the semi-final. What would it have been like if we'd have won it? I think in many ways it was a turning point. We'd had Hazel and Hillsborough and those disasters in football, and now we had something pretty joyous. So near and yet so far. I think it was a turning point, and I think from then on, football did change. England's heroic defeat in Turin had reignited the public's love of the beautiful game. The years that followed would see radical change. English clubs back in Europe, newer, safer stadia, a decrease in violence, the Premier League, and billions of pounds in TV revenue. English football was reborn on the 4th of July, 1990.
26th of July, 2009, the England and West German players of 1990 are reunited for a tribute game to Sir Bobby Robson, who was nearing the end of his 17-year battle with cancer. He wasn't well enough to go, and the advice was for him not to go. Um, but he was so determined to go. And we just sort of tried to make a decision that, you know, he, well, he wants to go, so let's get him there. Um, you know, we, we knew it was obviously going to be his last public outing, or any outing. reception from the crowd was was incredible you know he was you could see that he was so pleased to, to, to be there it was a poignant farewell between Robson and his great team who together had done so much to restore pride in English football I had a look at me through a few tears I think well we did lining up on the way back I asked him you know if he enjoyed the, the game and he just you know went yes and then he came out with, and he asked, you know, how did, how did Gascoigne play? Is that what he said? He's always taking them on his money. Yes, Bobby. Is that what he said? Then? How did Gascoigne play? Despite his, you know, how unwell he was, he was still concerned about, you know, the players. I mean, it was quite incredible. It just encapsulated everything about Dad. I mean, he was like the second dad to us, really, you know? I would say, a great man, a great man, you know. World Championship 2010. Bring it on. Lucas Aid Sport. The Edge.